previously, I mean, I never even designed the whole game or the whole story before I started developing it. Hello, and welcome back to the point and click devlog, an ongoing series in which you'd be surprised how little I've actually achieved. This week though, my progress, or the lack thereof, is taking a back seat in favour of seeing what advice we can glean from Joel Stoffhaster, the man behind indie game studio Clifftop Games, and the designer and writer of two of my favourite point and click adventure games of the past decade, Kathy Rain and Whispers of a Machine and also the man who I had to ask forgiveness ahead of time from for pronouncing his name wrong. I recently grabbed half an hour with Yule to talk about his career to date and to see how his game development processes have evolved from his first game through to his second and now as he develops a new mystery project. First up though, how did Yule get started? Oh, well, I think it was uh, when I went to school for game development actually. In 2000 and well rather it's much earlier than that actually it was uh, way back in the day when I was maybe like 14 15 when I started messing around with uh, something called games factory uh, right. it was kind of inspired by something that came earlier called click and play uh, and I think game maker is sort of that sort of thing uh, and I was trying to make a link to the past clone <laughs> uh, and failing failing miserably but uh, that was sort of my first uh, contact with uh, with game development and then many years went by until i until i actually realized uh, becoming a real game developer I, it was for a long time it was just a dream for me yeah uh, until i went to school for for games development there's a school here in sweden called the playground squad which is okay. sort of a, a practical school uh, aligned with, with game development so uh, i went there as a programmer uh, and after that i got an internship and a job as a programmer yeah, I started at the Starbreeze in Uppsala. Uh, then I spent some time at the Paradox in Stockholm. Uh, and then after that, I did my own thing with, with Clifton. So that's the basic gist of my journey, I guess. And it was while Ewell was working full time that he began work on Kathy Rain, a side project he was working on out of hours. Started out as sort of a, uh, a project on the side of, of my usual a day job basically uh, and it eventually it turned into a commercial commercial game uh, and it was signed by a publisher and that sort of allowed me to do it full time so. like all of us yola was inspired by some of the classics and modern classics of the genre well my favorite point of click games uh, i would probably say gabriel knight has to be one of them uh, I, i'm a big fan of what did i games their entire catalog uh, but also some of the lucas arch classics like day of the tentacle full throttle Love those games, uh, and I think uh, games both uh, contemporary and the classics uh, are awesome. I love point and click adventures. And because this was an out of hours project, I find it weirdly reassuring that Kathy Rain took him a fair while to make. I think I started it in 2011, and it wasn't released until 2016, so it was quite a while. But obviously, it was part time at first, and it, things went kind of fast when I started uh, full time. So. If you've not played Kathy Rain, it's a lovingly crafted ode to all things 90s, in which the titular protagonist gets embroiled in a small town mystery with eerie undertones. If you like Twin Peaks, Stephen King, and detective fiction with a hint of Buffy the Vampire Slayer's attitude, it will be right up your street. It's also the kind of point and click game I enjoy most, one in which you won't find infuriatingly difficult puzzle after infuriatingly difficult puzzle. Instead, you'll get a steady flow of clever but logical puzzles that are principally there to serve a compelling story and rich atmosphere. And as I learned, that's because Yoel values the latter more than the former. I guess because it, it blends puzzle solving and story in a really neat way and you can participate in the story more than you do maybe in a ver in sort of visual novel or walking simulator but it's not a pure puzzle game either i mean uh, some point of adventures are really puzzle heavy like the bully park is probably on the puzzle heavy side and i'm i'm more of a narrative guy i think my games are more story driven uh but yeah i think it's a combination of, of puzzles and story is what makes point of click adventures unique to me Puzzles are a way to involve the player in the story more than uh, serving as a challenge, I guess. 
Yol's second game, Whispers of a Machine, built on what made Kathy Rain such a great entry in the point and click oeuvre, but added a huge dollop of Scandi Noir sensibility and painted the whole thing in a rusty coat of dystopian sci-fi, with an art style that brings to mind the work of Simon Stallenhag, whose name I also can't pronounce. But Whispers of a Machine was also a departure in terms of the production process because unlike Kathy Rain, the game actually has two authors. Yoel partnered with Peter Lundqvist, another name I can't pronounce, from Faravid Games to create, write and design it. And it turns out that going from being a solo dev to a full-on partnership doesn't come without its fair share of challenges. Well, I, I'm kind of a control freak, so it was probably not the best idea. Uh, so, and we both uh, had uh, really strong opinions about game design and about narrative. So, uh, yeah, we had a lot of uh, conflicts over the years, and we had to. Uh, it took a lot of time and energy that could have probably been avoided if we had like uh, had more separate roles, I guess. Maybe one person could be in charge of like the overall narrative structure and that sort of thing, and the other guy would sort of implement the details. Uh, or just one person would be the writer and that's it. Uh, could have saved some time, I think. But um, yeah, so it was a big challenge for both of us, I think. Yeah, We probably expected things to work. Uh, I mean, just to give a little bit of a background, uh, me and Petter, uh, the other writer designer, and he also made the art and I made the code. Uh, it, for our previous games, we helped each other give a lot of good feedback on game design, story, that sort of stuff. So we probably both thought that, oh, we will just continue like this. We gave some good feedback to each other. I think it would be a good match. But uh, yeah, it didn't quite turn out that way. What I learned from Whispers was that I, I, it's important to me to have full creative control and not have to answer to anybody else. So, so that's something I learned. And I decided that my future games will be written and designed only by me. For what it's worth, I don't think control freakery is uncommon in this industry. I'm a control freak too, so I can empathise in the challenges Yoel faced working with someone else on this kind of project. I'm not sure I'd have the stomach for it. Another big lesson Yoel has learned as he's gone from game to game is around planning and structure. As I've hopefully established on this channel, there really is no right way to go about all that stuff, but Yoel has found that over time, his processes are evolving into a work stream that works best for him. So, I mean, the first game started out as a part-time thing and I had no idea what I was doing, so I didn't have much of a process at that time, I guess. With Super Super Machine, it was a bit more planned in advance. We, we had a game design document and we had a, a narrative document, but uh, there were gaps and a lot of stuff changed over the course of the development as well. I know that some people are super detailed and they write dialogue in advance, everything in advance. But uh, for me personally, I, I found out that when I am implementing the stuff, things changed anyway, so I just don't bother with uh, too much detail. So I, right now, I always write dialogue as I implement the scenes when I have the, everything in front of me. Yeah. For this new game, well, I'm, I've tried to read up, read up more on specifically narrative. Uh, I've read a lot of script writing books because I think that's kind of close to game narratives. Uh, so I'm trying to be a little more structured this time around. And previously, I mean, I never even designed the whole game or the whole story before I started developing it. Uh, so this time around, I'm going to design the whole game and probably create like a rough white box version. I mean, a really simple programmer art version of the game yeah. uh, before I even bring in an artist to just get it right from the beginning, because I think that will save a lot of time in the long term. As I say, there's no real right answer when it comes to how you make your game. That's true whether, like Yoel, you want to build a basic version of the whole thing and then add dialogue and artwork later, or whether you want to do a Charles Cecil and write 500 pages of script before anything else. But as Yoel explains, there is one aspect of planning and game development that everyone should think about early. Platforms and how you manage ports. From Kathy Rain to Whispers, I mean, I learned a lot of technical uh, stuff, like, uh, for instance, uh, keeping mobile ports and translations in mind from the beginning. That was something that uh, uh, can be kind of tricky to do later in the development if you don't keep it in mind from, from the beginning. Uh, and also that planning more ahead, I guess. Uh, we also did it in Whispers, even though we didn't do that as much as perhaps we should have. But uh, yeah, just being more structured uh, in general. 
Personally, I find this really interesting, and there's a simple reason for that. I play a lot of point and click games on my iPad because I think it's basically the perfect device for the genre. On an iPad you have nothing but screen, making it easy to properly sink into an adventure game on the couch, but releasing a game on iOS isn't a straightforward process, especially if you don't think about it early on. For Yol, that thinking manifests in some pretty core game design choices. One thing we decided to do for Whispers was to have just a single click interface because that makes, makes touching on the mobile really straightforward. Yeah. It's really easy interface wise. Uh, we still opted to have a few sort of keyboard segments in Whispers because it was kind of neat with these computer interfaces to still be able to type in them. Uh, and it's doable with sort of a mobile keyboard that just pops up at the bottom. Uh, but uh, I mean, also trying to uh, keep the game understandable in a smaller size, I guess. On a smaller screen, you should be able to read all the hotspots and understand the scene uh, and be able to tap comfortably on what you need to tap on, that sort of thing as well. Yeah. I played both of y'all's games on iPad, so I was interested to know how many others had too, as well as how things have gone for him on Android. Android was super difficult, but it's probably more due to the engine, I guess. A lot of technical challenges with the, the engine okay. that I, I don't think there can be like broad, broadly understood. But um, uh, yeah, generally it's kind of the same on Android and iOS. I guess uh, Google changes the requirements a little bit more often than Apple. So usually when they update their operating system, you have to adhere to their new standards and you have to patch the game. So that can get kind of frustrating. But uh, yeah, they're kind of similar, I think. And according to Yoel, the mobile versions of Cathy Rain and Whispers of a Machine have sold about 20% the volume that they have on PC. One fifth may not seem huge, but think about that over a big enough numbers and suddenly it makes a lot of sense to think about how you're going to port your game from an early stage. It's one fifth of total Steam sales, again, that you'd otherwise lose out on. And that's before we even start talking about consoles like the Switch. Ron Gilbert, by the way, wrote a blog post a while back about how Thimbleweed Park sales on Switch were outperforming every other platform. The caveat there is that the game's Kickstarter backers don't show up as Steam sales, but still, it's a pretty surprising pie chart as pie charts go. Porting is such a big thing, in fact, that it's made Yoel switch game engines for his latest project, a project which is currently otherwise shrouded in mystery. Yeah, it, it's still a point-and-click adventure, uh, and we're working in, in Unity now, instead of Adventure Game Studio, okay. uh, as some other developers have also made that transition, mainly for technical reasons. It's easier with with the porting and translations and that sort of stuff. Uh, but it's, it's still a point-and-click adventure, but I can't really say much more than that. But we are okay. targeting all sorts of platforms, so it's a PC, mobile, the consoles, so yeah. We're using Adventure Creator, yeah, but we have modified it quite a lot, but it was a great start starting point. And I would encourage everybody who wants to make adventures in Unity to give it a go. Unity is a safe choice because you know that you will be able to target practically any major platform that is available now or at least in the future. It, yes, isn't very maintained these days. So even if there are some ports, like I know Wadi is working on a Switch port, there are mobile ports that are kind of hard to uh, get up and running. Uh, that's all there is. And Unity, with Unity, you'll know that you'll get access to everything in the future. So I would encourage you to pick that up. So look, if you're using AGS or Visionaire Studio, don't worry, those are both great engines with tons to offer. But as someone who's recently settled on Adventure Creator after a lot of back and forth, I find it personally quite gratifying to hear that AC is the way the wind seems to be blowing from someone whose work I really admire. Either way, the message is clear. Getting your game on as many platforms as possible is a pretty worthwhile endeavour. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. Anyway, that was just about it from my time with Yoel, except to ask him one more thing. What he thinks the biggest challenge is when it comes to being a solo dev. Oh, yeah, that's a really difficult question. But I mean, something that is, has always been difficult for me and still is, is, is sort of this work-life balance thing, basically. Uh, structuring up so you don't work too little or not too much. Uh, that's something I really had to change when I became a father. 
uh, because previously it wasn't that important when I worked or how I worked. So I had to sort of allocate uh, more in a more structured way when I would work or not. Uh, so that's something that uh, I think mo many people struggle with. Just mo most indies probably work way too hard and they get burned out. You know, I don't think anyone's ever accused me of working too hard, but if you recognize yourself in that burnout pattern, then take heed. Slow and steady wins the race, always. To that end, it probably won't surprise you to learn that I haven't done much on my own game in the past few weeks. As those in the Discord server will know, my wife and I moved out of our house at the end of November and are now in temporary accommodation until our new place is ready in late December. Turns out moving house twice in a month isn't very conducive to game development, who knew? Fret not though, I have got a plan of action and by the time the next video rolls around I promise I will finally have a main character walking around a backdrop. From there it's all plain sailing right? I guess we'll see. It's pretty likely that that video will arrive on the other side of Christmas though, so if I don't see you in the Discord or on Twitter, have a very lovely one in whatever Covid safe way you can, and I will be back with some progress in January. All that's left to say is thanks very much to Yoel for the opportunity to talk. There are links to both his games in the description and I think you could do worse than you know, to settle in with either of them over the Christmas break. And as ever, you could also do a lot worse than clicking that lovely subscribe button. It's down there where it always is. If not, no worries, I will see you in the next one. Feliz Navidad! <laughs>